Yeah. I also wanted to do a demonstration and was told we did not have the permits. On the night Chung Ling Su died, it was not clear whether his death was murder, suicide, or an accident. Two men shot him in one of London's largest theaters. That was not in question. Nor was the fact that they had been paid to shoot him by Chung Ling Su himself. And this was not their first magic show. It's just that Su had always caught the bullets had caught them not just hundreds, but thousands of times, presenting them on a porcelain plate he had held in front of him like a shield so the gunman could see the marks that two random audience members had scratched into the lead. But the deadly bullet, which had pierced Sue's heart, ripped through a backdrop and shattered a mirror backstage, did not have any of these marks, and the police had no leads. No one knew how or why the magician had died because no one but the magician knew how he performed the trick. This stunt could only have been pulled by a master. By the time he died on March 23rd, 1918, at the age of 57, the marvelous Chinese conjurer had sold millions of tickets everywhere from Europe, the United States, India, Australia, and Mexico. His act was a steady crescendo. Objects disappeared between his fingertips, burning embers turned into an explosion of ribbons in the magician's mouth, and his lovely wife and assistant, Sui Sin, was conjured out of thin air inside a spinning crystal lantern raised high above the stage. Su performed his tricks in rapid succession and absolute silence. The only words of explanation were delivered by his translator, Kamataro. Chung Ling Fu did not speak English. In the 18 years that Su had been performing, he had never uttered a single word on the stage. He did not need to catch bullets to be a master. But Su was also a lifelong showman, and he had seen proof of a principle described by his close friend, a man by the name of Harry Houdini. The easiest way to attract a crowd is to let it be known that at a given time and a given place, someone is going to attempt something that in the event of failure will mean sudden death. This was not hard to do. It was 1918. Dying tragically in a theater was practically an American pastime. <sighs> Sorry, this is gonna be dark. Scenery was built using the lightest, driest wood and the curtains, carpets, and cotton backdrops covered with flammable paint hung above stages lit by gas lights fed by fuel lines. Electric lights and machines were rare and prone to spark. There is a reason that theaters are superstitious. Luck is a correlative of our exposure to risk. Of the 10 most deadly single building fires in world history, each killing between 500 and 2,000 people, eight have been in theaters. Four of them happened during Sue's lifetime. Besides that, stage equipment failed and fell, lions and elephants rebelled, and costumes had to be treated with asbestos and other flame-proof poisons after the introduction of gas lamps as stage lighting had led to a precipitous spike in the mortality rate of ballerinas. That's another talk. The great Lafayette, a fellow star of the stage, had escaped with only a few large scratches when his own lion escaped during a performance. But his career had ended in 1911 when a fire broke out on the stage. Rescuers found a body backstage burned beyond recognition and identifiable only by the performer's costume and shoes. It was only after the ashes had been sent for burial that the workmen found another body, wearing not just Lafayette's costume, but also his own signature rings. No one but the crew, of whom many had also perished, had known that the great magician performed some of his most astounding illusions using a body double. Sue was aware of the risks that he was taking. And he was aware that for centuries, magicians had been testing their luck catching bullets, and not everyone had passed the test. The Delinskys had performed the trick by having their shooters exchange real bullets with fake ones before loading, but Madame Delinsky was killed in 1820 when one of the gunmen forgot to make a swap. 
To avoid this, some magicians selected a volunteer to mark the bullets and fire the gun, but loaded the guns themselves and palmed the lead. In the 1930s, magician Signor Blitz realized the flaw in this design when an audience member stood up wielding his own gun, and Blitz had to talk the man down from shooting him point blank. In 1840, Arnold Buck had successfully palmed the bullet in the act of loading, but had not when watching the vo been watching the volunteer closely and did not see the shooter drop several nails down the gun barrel before he fired. Sue's own friend Zanzik was already down an eye after standing too close to a gun firing blanks during a melodrama when he lost his index finger on his first attempt at the trick. He had forgotten to check if the pistol he bought secondhand the day before had been loaded. And only a few years after Sue's death, H.T. Sartell was shot and killed by his wife during his own premiere of the trick. He was using fake bullets and had taken all of the necessary safety precautions except for ensuring that he and his wife were on good terms. <laughs> And so Sue, an expert in magic and its history, took precautions. His bullet catch was performed at his own whim and rarely advertised. This is one of the few posters advertising it at all. The two trick rifles were kept locked away when not in use, and Sue himself prepared them in secret. He was meticulous in his craft and on good terms with the staff. This led the police to consider suicide. But it was unlikely, given that Sue had said what had, Sue had said when he was struck, breaking his 18-year silence on the stage to speak to the crew in his native tongue. Oh my God, something has happened. Lower the curtain. Scotland Yard called Robert Churchill, inventor of the comparison microscope used to match guns and fired bullets. He discovered that Sue's death had been a slow one. In a normal rifle, the hammer that strikes a spark is separated from the barrel that holds the bullet and powder by a plug with a small hole in it. The spark travels through the hole, which ignites the power and fires uh, the powder and fires the bullet. In Sue's rifle, that hole had been filled. Instead, a different hole had been drilled in the plug, opening into the narrow tube that stored the ramrod used to load ammunition. In Sue's trick, the ramrods were put aside after loading because the ramrod tubes were filled with gunpowder. Sue's guns fired blanks despite being fully loaded with real bullets. But these bullets had been carefully marked to match a pair that Sue was already holding. The swap between the bullets marked by the audience and the duplicates was made by Sue Seen as she carried them to the gunman on the stage. Drawing Sue's marked bullets on the, out after the performance using a long traditional screw would have scratched the lead and ruined the illusion for the gunman, who had shot Sue hundreds of times without ever knowing how he performed the trick. Instead, Sue emptied the rifles by opening them at the back and unscrewing the plugs themselves. Over time, the threads of the plugs had worn and the fine gunpowder Sue had used for the trick worked its way into the crevices. Eventually, this powder formed a fuse between the sparking chamber and the barrel that held a full charge of powder and a very real bullet. Rather than sending the guns to a shop for cleaning and repairs where the worn plug would have been discovered and replaced, the magician chose never to reveal his secret. Luck is merely the correlative of our exposure to risk. On March 23rd, 1918, after performing the trick thousands of times, Chung Ling Su's luck ran out. In the end, the police inquest ruled the shooting was a case of death by misadventure. I would like to give a toast to the marvelous secrets we live and die by, and to this man who, in keeping his secrets, made himself marvelous to us, to William Ellsworth Robinson. I'm not done. Born in, 19, in 1861, Robinson grew up in Lower East Manhattan as the eldest son of a stage manager for a vaudeville saloon. He practiced magic and performed at private parties before taking a job at a brass factory until his metalworking skills landed him a job at Martinka's, the largest magic shop and manufacturing company in the city. For his own act, he adopted his own signature title, The Man of Mystery. 
Robinson was a master mechanician, but a lackluster performer. He had little innate charisma, hated the sound of his own voice, and only found comfort on the stage when playing the part of someone else. But he gained an edge, debuting a series of illusions known as black arts for the first time in the United States after seeing them performed in Europe, and the smash hit that secured bookings on a theater circuit owned by the illustrious B.F. Keith. It also attracted the attention of American's two greatest magicians, Harry Keller and Alexander Herman. Now, the rivalry between Herman and Keller could be a talk in and of itself. Let, let's just say that shit was intense, and Robinson toured with both of them. His expertise catapulted each of their shows to new heights and made him the subject of a constant bidding war. No one knew him as the man of mystery anymore. Behind the scenes, they called him the magician maker. The buck stopped in 1896 when Alexander Herman died unexpectedly. After a brief engagement as stagehands for the Herman's widow and his nephew, Leon, Robinson once again set off to make a go of it on his own. He failed to demand the, the attention necessary to become a star, and his career might have stalled out were it not for the arrival of a worthy rival of his own. Just to be clear, this guy is actually Chinese. In 1897, Chi Ling Kua was invited to perform in the Chinese pavilion at the Omaha exhibition in San Francisco. He took up a stage name for his American debut, Ching Ling Fu. There, he astounded spectators by producing a variety of objects from under a silk cloth on the ground, including a tray of walnuts, a large basin of water, live animals, and his own baby. It was at this exposition where Robinson, on brief tour with Leon Herman, first saw Fu's act. The next time he saw Fu, Fu perform was on the stage of a Keith Theater as part of a 40-week engagement. Robinson had just performed a week of his own show on one of Keith's stage, stages. He had not been booked for further performances. So, in 1899, when Fu arrived in New York and issued a $1,000 reward to any magician who could duplicate the trick, Robinson was ready and waiting for him. Performing Fu's water bowl trick, a trick would be Robinson's greatest illusion to date. He had discovered that the bowl was conjured from where it was hiding beneath the Chinese magician's silk robes. To perfect the illusion, Robinson himself would have to become Chinese. The challenge had been meant as a publicity stunt and the duel never occurred. Instead, Robinson set off for London for a European debut of Chinese magic under a new stage name, Chung Ling Su. Now, at the time, this was not actually that bizarre. It was common practice for Westerners to appropriate Eastern culture and personas as part of their act. While on tour with Herman and Keller with his Black Arts Act, Robinson had performed under the names Abdul Khan and Nana Sahib and Ahmed Ben Ali. Bari names was also common practice. Harry Houdini was a reference to magician Jean Robert Houdin, and the great Lafayette, who had also had an act in the guise of a Chinese man, had lifted his own appellation, the man of mystery, from Robinson himself. But most magicians keep their personas to the stage. Robinson, whose Chinese magic act became a sensation with British audiences, took his out into the streets and then went an extra mile. He adopted a signature of Chinese characters, published a book called Fairy Tales from China's, uh, China, and added real Chinese performers to his act for credibility. He started a collection of Chinese art and curios, which he would display in museum lobbies and theaters. Robinson even created an elaborate backstory for Sue's press interviews, which were facilitated by his interpreter, Kamataro, who would seem to converse with Sue in Chinese before delivering a response in English. None of the reporters ever picked up on the fact that Chung Ling Su spoke English or that Kamataro, who was from Japan, didn't speak Chinese. <laughs> but Robinson wasn't fooling everyone. In 1904, Ching Ling Fu arrived in London, just before Su's debut at the London Hippodrome. On opening night, Fu had purchased front row seats. He went to the papers the very next day, declaring in broken English that Chung was a fraud. Not only were his resplendent robes a deadly taboo for anyone who was not of royal blood, they were also taboo for anyone who was not a woman. 
<laughs> so, Ching Ling Fu issued a new a challenge. He told the reporters from the Express that he would pay... Oh, Ching Ling Fu issued a new challenge. He told the reporter from the Express that he would pay Chung Ling to Su 1,000 pounds, which was $5,000, if Su could reproduce 10 of Fu's 20 tricks, or if Fu failed to reproduce a single one of Su's. Su, of course, was initially unavailable for comment. As you might recall, he did not speak English. <laughs> but he dispatched his translator, Kamataro, who announced that Su had declined the duel as the marvelous Chinese conjurer's esteemed rank prevented him from engaging in such base disputes with a member of the lower class. Chung Ling Su's robes were worn in recognition of the honor bestowed on him by the Empress Dowager herself. And he would not respond to the aggravations of a slave who juggled for coins on street corners, nor a thief who had only found success by stealing Chung Ling Su's own tricks. To put this in modern terms, Su's response proved that you don't need a fire to burn someone by gaslighting them. <laughs> but, Putting aside any semblance of morality, this was the right move. Robinson had bet his life on leading a double one. Chung Ling Su was the star that William Robinson never would be. Su so was his greatest trick, but Fu was holding all the cards for it, and the only way to beat a good hand is with a better bluff. But Fu was not willing to fold so easily. A reporter arrived at the Hippodrome with a copy of Fu's challenge and sat outside the stage door for three days waiting for a response. Finally, he was granted an audience with Su and his interpreter, who pointed out that Su was at a distinct disadvantage, never having seen Fu's act. However, he was aware of the five feats Fu had performed since arriving in London, and he was prepared to execute all of them himself in a showdown at the weekly dispatch offices. He also secured an agreement with the reporter that the two magicians would perform with a pane of glass between them so that there was no chance of a physical or verbal exchange. Fu was ready to call him, but first he doubled down on his original challenge and raised the stakes, adding that Su must appear in front of a Chinese legation to prove his heritage. <laughs> but Ch Chung Ling Su's luck would not run out until 1918. The weekly dispatch had found Su's terms satisfactory, pronouncing that the public did not care about the ancestry, but about the conjuring. Fu had botched his trick. A stranger in a strange land, he had not understood the risks of seeking justice in the court of public opinion. It did not matter to the papers that no one bothered to confirm whether Fu had agreed to Robinson's terms. And so when, on the morning of January 7th, in the presence of the editors of the Weekly Dispatch and a celebrity judge by the name of Harry Houdini, Chung Ling Su waited for a challenger who never arrived. He was declared the winner by default. In the papers, it was suggested that Ching Ling Fu really had shown up, but that the marvelous Chinese conjurer had rendered his challenger invisible. <laughs> and so I raise my glass again to Chung Ling Su and to taking a chance on someone new who we find within ourselves. All right, well, I do hope that tonight has inspired you to go out and take some risks. Let's give a big round of applause for our speakers tonight. Crystal, Willow, John, Nathan, Chris, Rebecca. Seriously. And coming up next, next on the roster, we have Mystery. Curated by our lovely Amy, our lovely resident woo girl of Odd Salon. <laughs> On October 16th, she'll be sharing stories of obscure origins and unsolved puzzles, secret scandals, disappearing colonies, paradises lost, biological mysteries in Wales, and even more. There are discount advance tickets for these salons at the merch table. Amy's hanging out over there doing the, the hand wave. Uh, be sure to join our email list so you can keep up with what we're doing, what's coming up next, pitches. Please pitch. Send us pitches. Tell us what you want to talk about. Get inspired. Find us on all the social medias. 
And also, if you like what you see here, please consider joining us as a member. We have this shiny brand new membership program. It's awesome. Uh, members enjoy both, both a host of insider benefits like ticket discounts and more odd salon stories from our fellows. You can go online for more info or inquire at the merch booth. Again, join us on something weird. Uh, we're going to be posting reading lists and follow-up info from all the talks that happened here tonight. So if you want to learn anything more about anything that you heard on stage, that is the place to go. Join us. We don't really bite. It's great. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to Public Works for hosting us. I want to give another round of applause for the speakers. A huge round of applause for all of our volunteers at the merch booth, at the door. This is a community effort. It's those folks who are making it happen and putting on this show. Thank you all so much for coming. Good night. I have to bogart the mic for, for one more thank you. I would like to issue a huge thank you to Casey for wrangling all the cats and making this happen. And thank you so much. Here's a high roller Harvey for all of your own adventures and bad decisions. <laughs>